Good, e good evening. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome you all here to celebrate our dear colleague Matthew Stevenson as he assumes his appointment as the Eli Goldston Professor of Law. And we're delighted to welcome Matthew's wife, Nari Luck Stevenson, also. So very good to have you here. So I'm, I'm especially happy uh, to commemorate this occasion with Matthew. Uh, uh, he and I first collaborated, I, I can't believe it, it's been more than 10 years ago, on a casebook called Legislation and Regulation which is currently in its third edition. Um, Matthew is an incredibly smart, generous colleague. Uh, he's also enormously fun to argue with. Um, he, especially about the Chevron Doctrine. Um, and what I'll say is that Matthew is enormously determined, as, he's as determined as he is brilliant. And if you disagree with him on a point, and I'm warning you all of this, uh, be prepared for a long string site of cases and articles showing why you're wrong. OK, now, before I turn to all of Matthew's really terrific accomplishments, I'd just like to say a few words about the Eli Goldston uh, professorship. Um, this chair was established in 1978. It's one of two professorships created through the bequest of Eli Goldston, who was a graduate of Harvard College, AB 1942, Harvard Business School, 1946, and Harvard Law School, 1949. Um, he transitioned very early in his career from law to business, and he held key positions in a number of key enterprise, of really uh, important enterprises. He also dedicated himself to philanthropy and served on the boards of a number of charitable and educational institutions. Here's something about Eli Goldston that's really worth highlighting. He was a vocal advocate of corporate social responsibility. And he once said, and I'm quoting here, I don't believe that business alone can solve our social problems, nor do I believe it alone has caused them. But they'll not get solved unless innovative businessmen who sense a changing world and feel challenged react in a fashion likely to produce profit as well as an imaginative, imaginative response to social need. And what uh, Eli Goldston did is he generously created this chair along with one at HBS in the hope that the incumbents of these chairs would, quote, join their skills and commitments in teaching, research, and course development to improve social conditions through men and women trained and motivated in management and legal fields. Now, this chair has had some really distinguished holders, including most recently George Triantis and John Goldberg. And today, we celebrate the appointment of a really, really great creative visionary teacher and scholar who really fulfills Eli Goldston's vision, Matthew Stevenson. So let's give Matthew just another. I'm not done yet. There's more. Not a, not a ton more, but there's more. So, because I got to say that you're a world-class scholar, which you are, right? You're a world-class scholar. Your law, Matthew Stevenson's work blends law and political science. It sheds new light on administrative law, anti-corruption, separation of power, and judicial institutions. Uh, Matthew Stevenson has written numerous law review articles and book chapters, and um, he's uh, had his work appear in the American Political Science Review, the Harvard Law Review, the Yale Law Journal, numbers of journals. He's, uh, it, at some point in his career, a few years after he got tenure, he shifted his interest from you know, the greatest subjects on earth, uh, administrative law and legislation, to another really important subject, global anti-corruption. Uh, and um, he's really made a big change in that uh, subject. He founded and edits the Global Anti-Corruption blog, which promotes important, entrenched, and impactful analysis of the problems of corruption all over the world. It has thousands of followers, including high-level stakeholders at the World Bank and in the US government, at the UN, and major NGOs. And it's contributed and shaped policy debates all over the world. In addition, he goes around the world as a consultant and advisor to important institutions, such as the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the United Nations Development Program, as well as national governments and civil society organizations. Uh, Matthew studies, learns, teaches, and writes about 
anti-corruption judicial reform and administrative procedure. And he was the principal drafter with Richard Messick of the United, State, United Nations Convention Against Corruption's National Anti-Corruption Strategies, a Practical Guide for Development and Implementation, which is already an influential guide that offers recommendations to countries considering drafting or revising a national anti-corruption strategy. Matthew Stevenson is also a clear, candid, open, and beloved teacher. He is a brilliant interlocutor on this faculty. He makes the work of everyone around him better. Uh, he adds to every discussion and adds so much to the intellectual life of this school. Um, I met Matthew Stevenson when I was already a fairly uh, mature scholar, um, and he's changed my mind about a number of things including the Chevron Doctrine, um, and his keen, and intellect, his keen intellect and generous spirit have improved my work over the years, as I know it has the work of many others. At the end of this evening's lecture, I hope you will stay, stay around and celebrate Matthew at a cocktail party and reception, and there'll be some hors d'oeuvres, and it'll be wonderful uh, after the uh, talk. And so without further delay, I present to you the Eli Goldston Professor of Law, Matthew Stevenson. Um, thank you very much, Sean, for that kind introduction. Thank you to all of you who are here, um, my wife, my colleagues, my dean, my students, friends. Uh, this, is, this is really uh, great, and it's a nice reminder of uh, just how lucky I am to have the job that I do in the place that I am. Um, I'm reminded of an exchange I had with a, with a friend of mine when I, I was lucky enough to get a clerkship with Justice Kennedy in the U.S. Supreme Court, and the week that I started, a good friend of mine was just finishing up her uh, clerkship with Justice Ginsburg, and we got together for coffee, and I was asking her for advice on things that I should keep in mind throughout the year, things that I should make sure that I did during that time, and she said, yeah, um, every once in a while when you get to work, go in through the big doors. And what she was conveying was that after a few days or weeks, it becomes a job like any other job. There's the work that you have to get done. You've sort of got your narrow focus and, and, and you know, the hassle and the stress and so forth. And her point was, every once in a while, you should remind yourself, this is like an amazing thing. It's like an amazing opportunity that you have, and it flies by really quickly. And one way to appreciate that is every once in a while, instead of going through the side door for the court employees, like, go up the big marble stairs and in through the big doors. And that always stuck with me, and I kind of feel like this moment now, again, with so many friends and family and colleagues here, this is like a go in through the big doors moment. It's a nice reminder that you know, stepping back from the day-to-day -day stress and tasks and deadlines and so forth, it's really, really, uh, I'm incredibly blessed and fortunate to be able to uh, do what I do in the place uh, that I do it. So I'm grateful to all of you for making that possible. Uh, as John mentioned in his very generous opening remarks, the main focus of my research for the last several years has been on corruption and anti-corruption. And I should clarify that by corruption, I'm uh, principally talking about things like bribery and embezzlement, nepotism, conflict of interest, and so forth. And I say that because the word corruption is used to mean a variety of different things in a variety of different contexts. And uh, none of these usages are necessarily correct or incorrect. They're just different. And so, you know, my colleague Larry Lessig is here, and he uses this term in a particular sense. Our former colleague Elizabeth Warren uses this term in a broader sense than I mean it. She's busy doing other things right now. Um, but the topic that really uh, I wanted to focus on was corruption, maybe the more traditional, narrower sense, abuse of public power for private gain, principally private material or political gain. And the reason that I gravitated towards that topic was because when I was in as an undergraduate and then when I started my, my graduate program, I became very interested in uh, what we sometimes call in the law school world law and development, the role of law and legal institutions in the process, not just of economic development, but social, political development, the improvement of people's lives. And um, my colleague and mentor, Bill Alford, who's here, sort of set me on that path and gave me some things to read and talk about. And that was what I thought my focus was going to be. Uh, and then I took administrative law, which, as John said, is like the greatest subject in the world. And it re completely reoriented my focus. And so for um, most of the early part of my career, I was doing principally the political economy of administrative law. Uh, and then 
in 2010, I got tenure, and so that was great. I did a little happy dance. That was another like go through the big doors kind of moment. Uh, and I had a wonderful conversation with uh, another mentor of mine, my dean at the time, Martha Minow, who I'm grateful is also in the room. And she said, uh, now is the moment. You have tenure, but what you also need to cultivate is tenure of the mind. And I'll admit at the time, I was kind of like cynical about that phrase. It called up images of kind of like professors sitting on their laurels and in their office and whatever. But, but I reflected on it and I realized she was right, that this was an opportunity to maybe step back and try to think about doing something different and more ambitious and to really try to get my mind around a, a big and fundamental problem with, that has both a lot of intellectual uh, puzzle aspect to it, but also has important practical consequences. And so that was what set me on this path. In some ways, this is a very different sort of thing than what I had been doing previously. But the more I think about it, the more I think that they're really of a piece. My, my work in anti-corruption and my work on the political economy of administrative law both take as a central starting point the premise that an effective and capable government is essential to improving human welfare and solving social problems and focuses on the question of how can we design appropriate institutions, including but not limited to legal institutions, that will harness and channel incentives in an appropriate way. So in that sense, the work really is uh, very similar. From a law and development perspective, again, I wanted to get back to law and development. One of the reasons that corruption and anti-corruption became my central focus is that it became clear to me from talking with colleagues and others who work in this field that many of the development challenges, many of the fundamental challenges that developing and other societies face are caused at least in part by entrenched corruption. So uh, lack of access to health care, poor health conditions, uh, inadequate education, poverty generally, including the ineffectiveness of anti-poverty programs, uh, the challenges of uh, cultivating entrepreneurship and capital formation, uh, environmental protection, all of these things have endemic corruption as a root cause. And beyond that, there's considerable evidence that endemic corruption undermines confidence in government generally and faith in democracy and can be a significant contributor to political instability and in extreme cases, uh, political violence. So it seemed like that it's this underlying fundamental challenge uh, that we need to understand if we're going to make headway on all of these other problems. At least that's what I've come to believe. I should say at the outset that this idea that corruption is a fundamental problem, especially in developing societies, and one that should therefore uh, lead us to make the fight against corruption a high priority, is not universally accepted. And so I want to say a few words at the outset about three what I'll call quasi-myths about corruption and its effect that are sometimes presented as arguments against the idea that anti-corruption should be a high priority in the development agenda. And I'm calling these views quasi-myths instead of straight-up myths because I actually think there's an important kernel of truth behind all three of the ideas I'm going to lay out. But nonetheless, I think that they are on the whole more false than true and more misleading than helpful. So quasi-myth number one is that corruption is a culturally relative concept such that practices that, call them Western or Northern countries, would think of as corrupt would be considered appropriate in other cultural contexts. So you hear arguments about traditions of gift-giving cultures or the different understandings about the line between public and private, for example, advanced as arguments that uh, the concept of corruption is a very culturally specific one and that by saying other countries should prioritize the fight against corruption, we are imposing a set of values that are not appropriate in other cultural contexts. Uh, this is an old argument. Uh, for example, Warren Hastings, who was the first British Governor General of India, uh, who was ultimately impeached and tried, though unsuccessfully, for a range of misconduct while he was Governor General, including bribery and corruption, said in his defense, actions in Asia do not bear the same moral qualities which the same actions would bear in Europe. This was central to his defense. Yes, I, I took bribes, I engaged in other cor corrupt activities, but over there, that's just the way things are done. There's a more modern version of this argument that asserts that the anti-corruption agenda is a manifestation of Western or Northern neo-imperialism. That argument, again, has a kernel of truth. It is true that there are cultural differences in how different societies understand appropriate government behavior. 
and that some conduct that would be considered corrupt in one setting would be considered not corrupt in another setting. As an aside here, though the argument is usually framed as what we in the United States would think of as a bribe, they think of as a legitimate gift. I actually think the US is more of an outlier on this than other countries in that conduct, especially in the campaign finance and lobbying context that in other countries would be considered blatantly and outrageously corrupt, we consider either legitimate or maybe even constitutionally protected. But nonetheless, there, there, is the, there is a kernel of truth to the idea that not every society understands the appropriate government behavior in the same way, but it's mostly false. And we know it's mostly false because there's been a great deal of empirical research, survey-based research and other research to figure out what do people actually think about corruption. And it turns out that there's very little variation either in terms of what kinds of conduct people understand as corrupt, at least if we're talking about call it the core of corruption, bribery, embezzlement, nepotism, et cetera. These things are broadly understood as corrupt across a whole range of societies, and they are also understood as wrongful. It seems that the attitude that prevails in societies beset by endemic corruption is less acceptance and more something like cynical resignation. Not that people think that it's okay, but they often feel trapped in a system where it's bad, but there's nothing that we can do about it. But it's not the case that this sort of conduct in other parts of the world is accepted as okay. The second quasi-myth that I want to address is the idea that at least in poor countries, in developing countries, corruption can actually be efficient that far from being an impediment to economic development, corruption actually facilitates uh, economic development. And uh, this idea was nicely captured by a line uh, from the political scientist and my former comparative politics teacher, Samuel Huntington's uh, 1968 book, where he said, in terms of economic growth, the only thing worse than a society with a rigid, over-centralized, dishonest bureaucracy is one with a rigid, over-centralized, and honest bureaucracy, by which he meant when the rules are bad, when the rules are inefficient, corruption is the only way anything gets done. The only way anyone can start a business, the only way people can make any kind of progress is by greasing palms and engaging in various kinds of petty or other corruption. So here I want to give the argument it's due. There is a kernel of truth to this argument. There are circumstances, and one can describe them, where when the rules are inefficient, when the laws are inefficient, corruption can be a kind of what economists would call a second best solution. So it's certainly possible, and in some cases it may be true. But this is another area where there's been, in fact, quite a bit of research on the topic conducted over the last 20 to 30 years. And the weight of the evidence is overwhelming the direction of corruption more often acting as an impediment to economic growth and development than as a facilitator of economic growth and development. One of the key reasons for this may be a point that the economist Gunnar Myrdal made way back uh, in response to Huntington, where he pointed out that very often all the red tape that corruption is supposed to help us get around is created deliberately by bureaucrats or other government entities in order to create opportunities for corruption. So it's not necessarily only the case that red tape causes corruption. It's also the case that corruption is one of the things that leads to the expansion, the proliferation of red tape. Another reason for this is that there are a lot of things that governments do that's very important to economic development besides granting businesses permits to operate. Things like investment in infrastructure and promoting other kinds of policies that are essential to economic growth are core tasks of governments that are not fulfilled effectively if all the money is stolen, for example. So that's the second quasi-myth I wanted to address. The third one is this idea that even if we accept that corruption is bad, and even if we accept that it's viewed as bad even by people within the societies that we're talking about, there's just nothing you can realistically do about it. There's an argument that corruption is so deeply rooted, so entrenched in particular cultures, that it can't be dislodged, at least can't be plausibly dislodged by anything that we could actively do through policy or institutional reforms. This is an argument, it's really struck me, this is an argument that I've heard frequently invoked by people within those societies. So as John mentioned, I've had the opportunity through this work to travel to a lot of different places and meet people who work on these issues in different countries. And it's been really striking. I hear the same argument repeated over and over again, but you can just fill in the blank with a different country or culture. So I was in Jakarta a few years ago, and uh, some very bright uh, interlocutors said to me, look, uh, we're never really going to make progress against corruption in Indonesia beyond a surface level because there's something deep and fundamental about the Malayan culture 
that contributes to corruption. And then I was in Brazil and I heard the same thing. Like they just, the Portuguese brought it over 500 years ago and there's nothing we can do. It's like deeply entrenched in our culture. Uh, I spoke with a Nigerian senior official once who made a similar point. It's like deeply entrenched in Nigerian culture. There's nothing that can be done about it. So here again, there's a kernel of truth to the argument insofar as corruption does have self-reinforcing or self-perpetuating tendencies. This is a theme to which I'll return in a moment. And for that reason, you can get these cultures of corruption that are very difficult to dislodge because corruption, in a sense, feeds on itself. That's right. However, there's um, no strong evidence that national cultures are significant predictors of corruption or corrupt behavior at the individual level or the country level. The evidence is just not there. More importantly for me, the more important piece of evidence for me against this idea that there's some kind of deep-rooted essential cultural tradition that makes anti-corruption reform impossible is if you look at the countries that today are at least perceived as performing relatively well on these international scales or indexes of corruption. If you we were to get into our time machines and go back 100, 150, 200 years, those countries would also look like they were beset by endemic fundamental systems of corruption that would be very easy to attribute to something about those countries' national cultures. So if you take Sweden, for example, and today we've got the stereotype of this, the Nordic countries generally performing well and high integrity and so forth. I've read a little bit of Swedish history. It's not something I had a lot of background in, but thanks to this, I learned a bit about Swedish history. If you look at what the Swedish state looked like in 1800, it was thoroughly corrupt. Offices were bought and sold, nepotism was rampant, bribery was rampant. If you look at the United States, certainly no paragon of anti-corruption, but again, compared to modern societies like Cambodia, Nigeria, and Sri Lanka, doing much better. If you look at the US, at the end of the Civil War in 1865, or certainly if you go earlier, you see deeply entrenched cultures of corruption, especially at the state and local level, but at the federal level as well. Finland apparently had such extensive corruption as late as the 1950s that the British embassy was warning British business people doing business in Finland that they had to be really on their guard because the corruption was so deeply entrenched. So if we take a longer view, we have a lot of examples of countries that seem to have made this transition from places where corruption was deep and entrenched to places where it's still a problem, but kind of a manageable problem, where it's no longer systemic. And these cultural stereotypes that we might have in our head that something, you know, Sweden for a thousand years has been a society of high integrity, it's just not true. Just not true. So uh, the challenge then becomes, how do we figure out how to make this transition? We know it can happen because a number of countries have done it. So, but how in the modern period can, we try, can countries try to help themselves along to that objective? Um, we don't really know, but we have the researchers who work in this area have started to figure out at least some useful and important facts about how uh, corruption operates. One of them actually picks up on something I said a moment ago, which is that corruption, like other social phenomena, has this self-reinforcing property. One of the causes of corruption is corruption. It can you can create these vicious cycles. This can operate through a variety of mechanisms. So for example, and here this is a point that's not specific to corruption, but many people, including my colleague Oren Bargill, who's here, have made in the context of crime generally, when a criminal activity is widespread and law enforcers have limited resources, and they can only catch so many of the people doing the bad thing, the probability that any one malfeasant is caught is lower, just by simple division. If you can only arrest 10 people on the highway for speeding, and 100 people are speeding, right? then there's only a 10% chance that any one person gets caught. If the probability that you get caught is lower, deterrence is weaker, which means more people engage in the wrongful conduct, which means the probability of any one person getting caught stays low. Another mechanism that in the corruption context is I think especially important has to do with social norms of appropriate behavior coupled with our senses of guilt or shame when we do things that we know we aren't supposed to do. So there might be conduct that is technically against the rules, and if you see nobody else engaging in the wrongful conduct, if you believe that conduct is rare, then the sense of shame or guilt that you might feel if you did it might be relatively high, which would keep the prevalence of the conduct relatively low. If the conduct is very widespread, if, if you think that most or all people in the office are taking bribes or skimming off the top, then the moral twinge that you would feel if you did the same thing will be lesser because it's one of those rules that, yeah, it's on paper, but no one really follows it. 
And if that's true, more people will engage in the conduct. And the very fact that more people are engaging in the conduct will reduce the moral sanction against the conduct for that reason. So this is a big problem. And the question is, when you have a country that's stuck in one of these vicious cycles, um, what can be done to get out of that situation? What sorts of reforms can help set a society on the path from endemic systemic corruption to uh, a system of limited or manageable corruption? Saying we'll get to zero corruption is not realistic. Corruption has existed in every society and probably always will. But again, in some societies, it is, as uh, Sarah Chase put the point, the operating system for the society. And in other, con in other contexts, it is a problem. But it's a problem that is a manageable problem, that it's the exception rather than the rule. So one set of prescriptions for how to get us set on this uh, good path that became especially popular right around the time of the fall of the Soviet Union, the transition from socialist to post-socialist systems, uh, said, well, to remedy corruption, democratize and shrink your government. There was a sense that if countries became more democratic, then political accountability would reduce corruption in government. And there was also this idea that bloated state sectors, a state that was doing too much, was a recipe for corruption. And as the late Gary Becker, the Nobel laureate economist, put this uh, second point in a headline of a, of a short piece that he wrote, uh, to root out corruption, boot out big government. So there's this idea that a combination of democratization and reducing the size of government would help. It turns out that the track record of that approach is not so strong. The empirical evidence doesn't seem to be strongly supportive of either of those propositions. With respect to democratization, it is certainly the case that even when con one controls for things like per capita gross domestic product, those countries that have been very democratic for a very long time are at least perceived as less corrupt than other countries. However, if you take out of the sample those countries that have been very strong democracies for 40 plus years, there doesn't seem to be any consistent pattern. There are differences, but not robust, statistically significant differences between, on the one hand, newer democracies or partial democracies, and on the other hand, autocracies. Now, it might be that it just takes time, that democracy has to become entrenched, that has to exist for a long enough period of time in order for the uh, corruption suppressing uh, effects of democracy to take hold. But it's, this is not entirely clear, and many new democracies have seen an upsurge in corruption, often in different forms, often corruption specifically oriented towards the winning of democratic elections. So, I like democracy. I would wholeheartedly support democratization. If anyone asked me if whether a country should democratize or not, I would say yes. But this is a caution that those who believe that democratization will end up having powerful anti-corruption effects, that once we democratize, it will follow more or less as a matter of course within a reasonable time frame that corruption will go down. Again, there might be a handful of countries in which that does seem to have taken place, but it doesn't seem to be true generally. With respect to the Becker hypothesis, again shared by many others, that shrinking the size of government will be associated with cleaner government, um, this fares even worse than the democratization hypothesis. It actually appears that although overregulation or inefficient regulation is associated with higher levels of corruption, the size of government, typically measured by government spending and or government revenue as a percentage of gross domestic product, is correlated with lower rather than higher levels of perceived corruption, even if one controls for national wealth. So those countries that have larger governments in that sense, that tax more, that spend more, seem to be perceived as less corrupt than other countries, even countries at an equivalent level of income. Now, the reasons for this are not completely clear. There is a cause-effect question. It's not clear whether larger governments reduce corruption or whether it's that less corrupt governments are able to grow more, maybe because citizens would be more supportive of a larger role for the state if that state is perceived as less corrupt. But nonetheless, the, the simple version of a hypothesis that uh, a bigger government is going to be generally associated with more corruption uh, doesn't seem to hold true. OK. so. Um, that hypothesis doesn't seem to work out so well. That said, we do have some pretty decent evidence about some of the measures that can help fight corruption effectively, at least on the retail level or the short-term level. We know less about broader societal transformations, but we actually do know a fair bit about the kinds of policy measures, legal and otherwise, that can effectively reduce corruption. And the list is actually not that 
surprising, right? So effective criminal law enforcement is not sufficient, but almost certainly necessary. The creation of a specialized body to deal with corruption, specifically a specialized anti-corruption agency, um, may be helpful in under, under some circumstances, but it appears that that particular institutional device is neither necessary nor sufficient to fight corruption effectively. The law enforcement piece of this is, by the way, not just limited to laws that are specifically anti-corruption laws, laws against bribery or embezzlement, but there's all sorts of, call it corruption adjacent areas like money laundering or a corporate transparency where uh, there's great deal of evidence that these kinds of legal interventions can be effective, not in achieving an immediate societal transformation, but reducing uh, the level or extent of corruption. Whistleblower protections, super important, much in the news now, right? Um, things like asset seizure. So following the money turns out to be really important. Sometimes it's easier for corrupt actors to cover up evidence of the underlying corrupt crimes than it is for them to hide and or explain away the proceeds of corruption. So some of the most effective anti-corruption measures we've seen emerged in the last 10, 15 years or so target the money, try to, uh, try to locate, freeze, seize, and eventually uh, return or otherwise redistribute stolen assets. Within the bureaucracy, in addition to enforcement of criminal and other laws, uh, audits of government programs turn out to be really effective. This is one of the areas where, the, where there's been some of the most rigorous economic research, including the use of randomized controlled trials. So Jim, shout out to you. Uh, they've done it here. And the place where they've done the most randomized controlled trials is looking at the effect of audits. When you tell certain people, yeah, your program is going to be audited, and then you actually audit all the programs and see what happens. And having regular audits uh, sig significantly reduces theft from public programs. Other forms of bureaucratic oversight are important as well. And civil service reforms, in particular reforms that promote things like meritocracy and hiring and promotion, norms of professionalism, and a great deal of autonomy for civil servants, especially though not exclusively those who have some kind of an anti-corruption function. So this is kind of interesting to me as someone who also, when I have my other hat on, do, does like US administrative law, because we've got this kind of obsession in the US, at least in some quarters, about like we have a unitary executive, the president has to control everything, we need to have political control because otherwise we won't have accountability and so on and so forth. And while for purposes of this talk, I'm not gonna engage in the constitutional arguments about the correctness or incorrectness of that. If you look internationally at the available empirical evidence, it actually looks like that like strong political control of the bureaucracy, including law enforcement and prosecution, is not the best way to go about reducing corruption. It seems to be quite the opposite. John is gritty. Maybe we'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, so uh, free press, access to information, coupled with appropriate accountability mechanisms, including, though I said democratization wasn't the, the a panacea earlier on, a free press coupled with accountability mechanisms, which could include democratic elections, there's fairly strong evidence that this has significant corruption reducing effects. So we know a lot, not as much as we would like to, but we know a fair amount about the kinds of tools and techniques that can help reduce corruption. To my mind, the real challenge in this area is not coming up with the right tools and techniques. I think that's important. I think that a lot of people have been doing a lot of very good and interesting work developing new tools to put into the toolkit, and I think that's great. To my mind, the most fundamental challenge in achieving a genuine transition from a more a systemically corrupt system to one where corruption is limited and manageable is a political problem. It's not so much a problem of the technology of anti-corruption tools, it's a political problem. And the problem was once, I think, aptly described to me as uh, how do you get turkeys to vote for Thanksgiving, right? How do you get the people who's, who benefit from the current system to agree to fundamental reforms that are gonna make their life uh, much worse? And this is a fundamental problem in many areas of political reform, but I think it's especially pertinent here. Um, on the one hand, those with the greatest ability to change the system have the weakest incentives to do so because they are almost by definition the winners under the current system. Um, those with the strongest incentive to change the system have the least ability to do so because again, almost by definition, they are denied access to political and economic power by virtue of the corrupt system that's in place. So this strikes me as the fundamental challenge of addressing this topic. And it's one, um, frankly, that those of us in the community of anti-corruption scholars who research in this area haven't really gotten our minds around. So on the topic of what are the economic effects of corruption, a ton of work. So I have a bunch of file boxes in my office because I'm old fashioned, still do things on paper, so I have them all sorted into categories. My boxes 
on the topic of does corruption uh, impede economic growth. I've got like five or six file boxes full of just papers on that topic or similar topics. Then I've got my collection of materials on how politically can countries or reformers develop effective coalitions to break out of this political logjam. And there I've got like one box and that's generous because I keep trying to stick things in there that might be sort of relevant and, I, and I'm kind of, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of reaching there. So this, I, I, I wish I could offer you as the conclusion to this lecture answers to that question. Unfortunately, I can't. This is something that I'm hoping will be a focus of my work here um, going forward. I will note that uh, at least th you know, three different possible ways one could try to escape this conundrum that have for which we have examples in the world and for which there are advocates both in the scholarly community and the reform community uh, more generally. So option one is a strong leader with centralized power who can push through dramatic comprehensive reforms in a relatively rapid fashion without much resistance. So this might be uh, an autocratic leader. Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore is like everyone's favorite example of this anti-corruption strategy. So yeah, it's true that the winners generally benefit for the corrupt system, but you could imagine a far-sighted leader, a wise king, say, who's sufficiently secure, uh, that they can say, you know, we're just, we're going to change the system. That's going to be my legacy. And again, Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore is everyone's favorite example of this. Saakashvili in Georgia, uh, maybe another example of this, nominally a democratic system, but with a lot of power concentrated in the president, where he managed, he fired like all the traffic police overnight and replaced them. And a lot of people get very excited about this. This is, you, you can't do that in other systems. You can do that here. Um, Xi Jinping in China clearly wants to be following this model. It's very much the idea of the, the enlightened leader who recognizes the harm that corruption can pose to the society, who's sufficiently secure and family is sufficiently wealthy, uh, that he's not worried about substantial anti-corruption reforms and so can push them through. Um, I'm not super excited about this model, partly because the cure might be worse than the disease, partly because it's very high risk. So if you get a wise king, monarchy may be the greatest of all political systems. If you get a mad king, uh, then it's horrible. And so you're staking a lot on the wisdom of the ruler if you're going to concentrate a ton of power in that one person. Um, there's also a very real risk that without broad input into these kinds of reforms, anti-corruption can easily be politicized or weaponized against political opponents. So Xi Jinping in China is again sometimes suggested as conforming to this model. I think uh, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia may quote conform to it even more clearly. So uh, if you're not going to go with an autocrat or even a democratically elected executive with extraordinary powers, what else might you do? Well, the second option, and again, we see some examples of this in the real world, is to take advantage of moments of crisis or disruption, uh, to, which create an opportunity for people who are usually outsiders in the system to effect genuine change. So Indonesia, after the Asian financial crisis in uh, 1997, 1998, when Suharto was finally pushed out of power, and there's the dawn of the so-called reformasi period, where reformers are able to push through all sorts of changes that would have otherwise been impossible, because there was that moment of disruption, crisis, and transition. Sometimes when a country loses a major war, that's another point when you can get a lot of soul searching and get a lot of change. And Swe I mentioned Sweden before. Again, what I've learned from Swedish history is it was losing a war against Russia that made at least some people within the Swedish state, state say, we, we got to fix this. The state has been hollowed out from the inside by all the corruption. We have to make changes. Um, so this, actually, this, this strikes me as an important thing to know for people who want to affect change. In particular, you know, there's the old adage that fortune favors the prepared. So even if it seems like you're constantly pushing up against this brick wall and not making any headway, you never know when the moment of crisis or disruption will take place. So it's probably a good idea to be prepared with the package of reforms that you want to put in place. I had a really interesting conversation last year with a Russian national who was working out a package of judicial reforms to deal not only with corruption but other issues. And he was, it was interesting, he was quite forthright. He said, look, I know there's no way any of this is going to happen now, not under the Putin administration. There's going to be no interest in it whatsoever. But I want to have it worked out now. So when the moment comes, and we don't know when it will be, we'll be ready. So we can be the ones to occupy the space and say, here are the things that need to be done. So that's important. Right? So that, that's important. But that said, waiting for a crisis to occur is probably not an entirely satisfactory anti-corruption strategy uh, for people who view this as a pressing problem and want to do something about it now. Um, so maybe there are no shortcuts. At least sometimes maybe there are no shortcuts, which leads to the 
third approach for which we have historical precedent and contemporary examples, and that's what I like to call the long, slow slog. Right? It's just a long struggle, two steps forward, one step back, a reform here, reform there, some backsliding. And it seems to involve, although again, here is where we don't really know the answer to the questions that we want to ask, coalitions of activists, civil society groups, businesses who are uh, frustrated with the current system, and political entrepreneurs, politicians who sense that they can actually uh, make some headway on this politically if they grab onto the anti-corruption issue and own it. And you get these coalitions that can form that over time can achieve significant progress. Uh, but the thing that we really don't understand is the process through which that happens, called the political economy of anti-corruption reform. In the absence of a central autocratic leader who can just do it, and in the absence of a disruptive crisis that creates unusual opportunities, what's the politics of how this all works? What do we know about how that process happens? And uh, again, the answer is, I don't know. I don't think the community of scholars that study this really know right now. But this is going to be what I hope will be a central focus of my research agenda going forward. And that research agenda, I hope, will have at least two components, one more theoretical and one more empirical but in a historical sense. So on the theory side, I have been particularly interested in this phenomenon to which I alluded earlier in the talk of corruption being self-reinforcing that uh, corruption begets corruption. And I was particularly taken with an argument that a number of prominent scholars, uh, many of whom I know, I know and respect, have suggested that that fact, the fact that corruption is self-reinforcing, self-perpetuating, means that the only way to really make progress against corruption is through what's sometimes called a big bang or a big push, doing a lot of things all at once very comprehensively to the way economically, in economics in, influenced social scientists would say shift the equilibrium from the bad equilibrium to the good equilibrium. Um, I think that argument is not right, actually. So without going into the details, although I'm happy during the Q&A to do so if people are interested, um, I think the underlying theory and the under, underlying models of self-reinforcing corruption do not imply that you need to have a big bang or a big push. And that in fact, those models can sometimes imply that incremental reforms can have a more positive effect, at least if they are pursued consistently and accumulate over time than a big bang. So this theoretical work led me to think that, at least in the abstract world of the models, contrary to much of the received wisdom, it's not the case that self-reinforcing corruption implies that if you had a choice between a temporary intervention that was very large and a series of incremental interventions that accumulated over time that the former is preferable to the latter. I actually think the latter is preferable to the former. Again, though, that's pretty abstract. And I, I love the world of theory. I mean, this is the political science tradition I came out of where you do like mathematical models and try to understand the world in that way. And I think that's valuable. Um, but it's not entirely satisfactory. Uh, so what I'm hoping to do in work going forward is to try to couple that analysis with some examinations of these historical cases where we do see a transition from a system of endemic corruption to one of more managed corruption. And rather than focusing on some of the contemporary cases that have attracted the most attention, cases like Hong Kong and Singapore, Georgia, and so forth, I actually think the United States is a really interesting case study to try to understand how this happens. So again, picking somewhat arbitrarily the period between the end of the US Civil War in 1865 and the US entry into World War II in 1941, so approximately 3 quarters of a century, there is a dramatic transformation in corruption in the US system. Again, it doesn't go away. But there's a fundamental transition, especially though not exclusively at the state and local level, from places where corruption is, again, to use Sarah Che's evocative phrase, the operating system, to a situation where corruption, though still a problem, is not the way the system works, but a problem that, that occurs and needs to be dealt with. Um, how exactly did that happen? This is something I'm interested in exploring. And I've just started uh, a joint project with Tino Cuellar, who some of you know, who's simultaneously a judge in the California Supreme Court and holds down a second job as a professor at Stanford Law School and makes me feel rather inadequate for, for that reason. Um, but the two of us, uh, after he presented a paper on a somewhat similar topic a couple of years ago, we, we, we thought that this might be a, a topic that's worth exploring. Because again, this story that the only way to root out systemic corruption is through a dramatic social transformation that takes place in a relatively short period of time, say within a generation, with big bang comprehensive reforms, does not appear to correspond to the US case. 
We, don't, we get fits and starts. We get two steps forward, one step back. We get moments of a lot of reform and then long periods where nothing is happening or we're getting backsliding. So what we hope to do is to try to understand that case better so we understand uh, more uh, in greater depth how that process takes place. Not because we think that every other country can or should follow the US model. I want to make sure I emphasize that. Every country is different. It has its own unique circumstances and politics. But our sense is that researchers in this area still don't have a, a firm enough handle on how the process of reform takes place, especially when it is spread out over a fairly long period of time. So that's where I hope this research agenda is going. So um, this has been obviously more of a bird's eye view lecture than a presentation of any specific research project. But I hope it's given you a sense of what I've been working on for the last several years and uh, plan to be working on for the next several more until I decide it's time for another moment of transition and pick something else completely different. So thank you very much to all of you uh, for listening. Of course, that's the best part. Uh, do I call on people or do you call on people? So I get to call on Martha. The tables have at last turned. <laughs> Only you still get to ask me a question, so they haven't really turned. Martha. So this is just wonderful, and how terrific to see uh, the work that you have been doing and will be doing. I wonder if there's a different way to slice it than Big Bang versus incremental. And I'm thinking, I, I should acknowledge I come from Chicago, which is a fine tradition of corruption. Um, but I also work with the MacArthur Foundation, which has a big project in, in uh, actually Nigeria. And the conception that I think has animated that work is that if you don't tackle causes, you can't actually expect change. So if school teachers don't earn enough to make a living, they will continue to demand bribes. And if there is no uh, effective press, it doesn't matter how much sunshine you think you're uh, exposing. So rather than big bang versus small, multi-sector or some, something like that. I'm wondering if you can comment on that. Yeah, I, th I think that's exactly right. So um, I don't view that as an alternative to the difference between a big bang and incremental reforms, but rather a complementary point about where you target the reforms. So the way this is sometimes framed is, do you want to go after the corrupt actors and use a strategy that's based on detection and punishment and therefore deterrence or prevention? Or do you want to attack what we sometimes call the root causes of corruption? So you referred to a couple of them, the, the underpayment of civil servants, um, the lack of an effective press, which is, of course, something I did mention in the talk. Uh, I mentioned the talk, again, the, the Samuel Huntington point about the rigid over centralized honest bureaucracy is, I think, wrong in general terms, but does hit on an important truth, which is if you have a system where it really is impossible to register your business if you follow the rules, or if not literally impossible, it takes years and years, how could we expect otherwise? Now, the, the simple dodge to this question, which also happens to be true, is to say both of these things are important, and it can't be one or the other, but you need to they need to work in tandem. I think, again, I think that's right. There's still a question about what's the right relative emphasis, and there's still a question about what actually are these root causes. So just to take one example, um, you mentioned civil service salaries. So it is a widespread hypothesis advanced by many, including perhaps not surprisingly civil servants, that excessively low civil service salaries contribute to corruption because exactly as you suggest, people need to make a living wage and they, uh, they're not paid enough. And sometimes there's even a kind of cynical, tacit complicity on the part of the government because we don't pay people enough because we expect they'll just make it up through bribes so we can keep the line item in the budget for teachers or police or health workers relatively low and spend money on other things because we kind of know that they're taking money under the table and that's how we'll be able to get enough people to do the job. I think that's absolutely got to be right sometimes. But interestingly, the social science research looking more broadly on correlations between average civil service salaries relative to, let's say, the average manufacturing wage in the country, to use that as a benchmark, and perceived corruption at least, which is often the only thing we can really measure you know, consistently at the national level, 
doesn't give you very strong results. Uh, the correlations there are not very strong. Um, and there are some more micro studies, including one that I just read recently on Ghana, where they did this experiment where they raised the salaries of police officers to see what happened. And the police officers kept taking salaries, they just uh, taking bribes, they just asked for more. And apparently what was happening is when you take a bribe, you're running a risk that you could be fired. If you're paid a higher salary, your job is more valuable. And so the bribe needs to be bigger to make it worth the risk. So one hypothesis, and I don't know if this is true, is that it's not that wages, civil service wages are unrelated to this, but this becomes more true in the extremes. So if you're really paying people below a living wage, then you're virtually guaranteeing that they're going to be taking bribes. If you adopt an aspect of the Singapore strategy, which is to pay at least your senior civil servants and a lot of your junior civil servants as well, really high salaries, one that equal or exceed comparable private sector salaries such that the value of that job is extraordinarily high, um, then I, there we don't have as much statistical evidence, but I think there's a strong, strong anecdotal evidence that will really help. But there might be a pretty broad range in the middle where actually doesn't make that much of a difference. And this turns out, again, I'm, I'm in the process of reviewing the literature on this to figure out what the answer actually is. Because this is one of those areas where we have like 20 different studies and it's hard to figure out which are the good ones and which are the bad ones. But this is important because if it turns out that raising civil service salaries is a really efficient way to reduce corruption, that, well, that consumes budgetary resources. So spending you know, $100 million to raise teacher salaries is a really good use of money. If it turns out that within the range that you're raising, it doesn't have much effect at all, then much as, for general reasons, I would love teachers to be paid more, from an anti-corruption perspective, it might be better to take that $100 million and spend it on something else, like regularly auditing the, the school budgets. So your point is absolutely right. We need to think about both of these things. But in both of these contexts, we really need to kind of drill down. And my talk was at sort of 30,000 feet. But to really do the reforms effectively, you've got to drill down and figure out what does is, what is the evidence show with respect to any particular reform, especially those targeted removing the so-called root causes of corruption. Jim. Oh, sorry. What is it that distinguishes the study of anti-corruption the way you framed it from the study of social change generally? So one can say that in many contexts, uh, ills, social ills, however conceived, are self-reinforcing mm -hmm. exactly, with exactly the same mechanism that you have, actually two mechanisms that you articulated in the talk. Mm -hmm. And that in any social change, there is a model of convulsive change that it depends on taking advantage of the opportunity and being prepared. And there is a, a model of Burkean, you know, incremental change. Yep. And so I guess what I'm wondering is, uh, why not just study social change if what you want to figure out is how to uh, promote an anti-corruption or any anti-ill agenda? That may be where I end up. I mean, I feel like, in the name of intellectual humility, uh, I'm reluctant to say I am studying social change. Like, my research agenda is to understand the world. Uh, but you're not wrong that, I mean, I kind of backed into this because I was interested, and this happens to me, like many of us get interested in some particular problem. And through the study of that problem, we realize that that problem is a particular manifestation of a much broader problem or challenge. And I feel like that's very much what's happened in this context with corruption. So a lot of what I have to say in the paper to which I alluded about the self-reinforcing self -reinforce, self corruption um, is not necessarily corruption specific. I don't, I don't think it necessarily is. Partly for that reason, I said, OK, well, let me look at the political economy literature more generally and the political economy of reform and see if they've nailed down this problem. And, and they haven't, which was simultaneously encouraging and distressing, uh, encouraging for me and my own personal research agenda, distressing for, for the world. Uh, but you're, but, but you're, you're, you're not wrong that I think that in general, so at the high enough level of generality, this is just a manifestation of a social problem. That said, and this picks up in my answer to Martha, when you actually get to the application or the specific mechanisms or the specific reforms, then things become much more particular. So the idea that certain social phenomena are self-reinforcing, that's a general point. You know, Some of the mechanisms through which corruption can be self-reinforcing are also very general. So I made a point uh, drawing on Orrin and others' work about the economics of crime generally. Some of them are pretty corruption, maybe not corruption unique, but more corruption specific. So I, I don't resist the point at all. I'm, I'm always happy to know that my work has much broader relevance than I thought. But I kind of feel like this is the particular social problem that I'm trying to get my mind around. So I'm just going to stay anchored to this, at least for now. Orrin. as compared to not just social problems or change generally, but I want to push a little bit more on uh, corruption versus just you know 
fighting crime or criminal justice more generally or law enforcement more generally. And so in your presentation and some of your answer to questions, you were talking about deterrence and kind of root causes. And you were talking about the benefit of increasing kind of better law enforcement. And so I'm, I'm wondering when we're talking about bribery as a criminal offense and some other kind of criminal offenses, why is, what is unique about corruption? Okay, so I could imagine if you have um, you know, a very strong law enforcement at the top, say the attorney general level, then this would be very effective in dealing with lower level corruption as just any other offense. So maybe the question is really when you took it as you did in your talk to, uh, from law enforcement to politics. So is it only, so is the difference only when we have corruption at the very top that it is different from the standard model of law enforcement or is there something else? I think in some respects it's not different. Um, I think the respects in which it is different you already uh, were getting at in your question, which is to the extent there's something distinctive about it, I don't want to say unique about it, or, or totally different, but, but distinctive, has to do with the fact that you're talking about malfeasance in the government itself that relates to the government's own function. So one of the reasons corruption is so particularly threatening to good government uh, is the fact that the government agents aren't supposed to be doing what, aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. With other kinds of crime, they can be very socially destructive, but you don't have the same degree of kind of, I was about to say conflict of interest, but of course that's a specific kind of corruption offense. I meant more in the, in the principal agent setting, right? The government officials want to reduce homicide and they might be better or worse at doing it. They might not invest a socially optimal amount of effort in doing it, but it's not like they're the ones who are benefiting from it. So I think corruption is distinct in that sense. That clearly applies when corruption is at the very top level, but not exclusively that. Right? You could have a local police station if corruption is taking place where, uh, there's that, where that problem uh, appears in a similar sort of way. Um, so I think that's probably the way in which it's, it's, it's most distinctive um, and maybe most problematic. Right? The fact that this is a, here, let's think about it this way. There's a, a, there's a class of, call it principal agent problems in government. Uh, and that's, a, not all of those are corruption in the narrow sense in which I'm defining it. There's a problem of criminal behavior, right, economics of crime. And the kind of corruption I'm studying is kind of at the, in the intersection of that set. It's criminal behavior, but it's criminal behavior of a particular kind that has to do with government agents not acting in the public interest. So I think that's probably the big, but again, as I said in answer to Jim, I don't want to draw a really sharp line. I'm not, I don't want to draw a boundary around this and say it's, it's fundamentally distinct from these other areas. There's a, there's a ton of overlap. Uh, yes, back there. I'm sorry, I don't know you. Yes. Thank you so much for the um, illuminating talk. My question is about um, countries that are sort of riddled with corruption, like Cambodia, for instance, and you're seeing instead of incremental positive change, um, like a further entrenchment of the corruption with the closing down and the overtake of like the Phnom Penh Post, for instance. Is there research being done on how technology or social media platforms are a kind of either enforcing and facilitating corruption or uh, undermining it? Yeah, there's actually a lot of research. I shouldn't say a lot, but there's a, there's a body of research that looks at particularly at information technology generally and social media more specifically. And the jury is still out to some extent. I would say that in this area, as in others, there was a phase of kind of techno-utopianism that, you know, well, now people have their social media apps and they can take pictures of the, uh, the highways that are falling apart and send them in or they can network with each other and, like, this will solve the problem. Um, there was, there are a number of websites have, have sprung up. That there's a, a very, most famous one is called I Paid a Bribe, which started in India. Uh, this is spread to other countries. There are others on, on this model. Um, I think that the, the sort of techno enthusiasm has, has faded a bit. Not to say that there's not something to this, but it seems that simply uh, online materials by themselves don't seem to make that much of a positive difference, and as your question suggests, sometimes can make things worse. Um, not necessarily with respect to corruption specifically, but of course this is a familiar topic about the role of social media in, for example, fueling uh, populism or spreading inaccurate information. For accountability, especially for corruption, people need to have accurate information about what's actually going on, and insofar as social media or certain aspects of social media kind of pollute the informational environment that undermines rather than facilitates. There is some interesting evidence that 
uh, for example, conducted in the United States that the initial introduction of internet technology, which took place at, at, in, at different places at different times the, in a seemingly random fashion, did seem to be correlated with some improvements in public integrity. So those places that got the internet first, and there's some, I won't get into the details of this, but there have some, they have some interesting ways of controlling for the fact that these places might have been different on other dimensions. You did seem to see some improvements. Uh, it seems to be, and maybe that has something to do with access to information, government websites, being able to file forms, for example, online as opposed to having to go to an office. So, there, so there's some evidence that it can be helpful. Uh, but I think if you were to ask this question 10 years ago to you know, a randomly chosen corruption researcher, there would have been a lot more enthusiasm about techno solutions than maybe there is now. And I think this is probably a pattern we've seen in a lot of areas where we go from a kind of hype to maybe a little bit, so then there's a backlash and a lot of cynicism, then maybe we kind of converge to a more measured, well, this can be kind of helpful, sort of, but it, it's not a fundamental game changer, so it seems. Larry. So if, if you take Fukuyama's work seriously, um, it seems like corruption might be the sort of problem we can't solve directly, only indirectly. So Fukuyama's, um, quite convinced that societies that develop really um, effective bureaucracies for whatever reason, either to fight wars or like China to deal with just very large societies, um, as a byproduct of bureaucracies which follow rule of law, you therefore get implementations of um, uh, uh, anti-corruption measures to be quite effective. Much better than societies that try to embrace democracy early on, where obviously there's lots of built-in incentives to play the corruption game. So I wonder mm -hmm. how you see your work in relation to Fukuyama. And the second part, the second part of the question leads from your um, Tino uh, research. So, um, you know, when you pick a period 1865 to 1941, what's striking about 1865, of course, is that it's at the end of a war, which means it's the end of a spending of a huge amount of government money, which obviously is going to be spent in a in a pretty dramatically uh, messy and corrupt way. And it was. And it was. Um, uh, but, but it leads me to wonder whether there isn't a way to think about you know, um, whether corruption is like rats. Like when there's not a lot of food out in the, you know, in the outside, then they work their way inside to get to the food. So in times when you've got really good growth, economic growth, businesses will just want to make money the old fashioned way by like going out and competing and, and doing well. And the return from corruption relative to business is low. But in times when business is bad or you've got this extraordinary opportunity like war, they're going to go on the inside. So I wonder, in the economic research that's looking at the kind of corruption that you're looking at, is there some connection here that tries to think about this shift between markets? Yeah, great. So there's a lot there. So forgive me if I don't get all aspects of the question. I, I hope we can continue to talk about this maybe, maybe afterwards. So with respect to the relationship between my work and Fukuyama's work, and maybe since I you know, I, I will acknowledge I have not read Fukuyama's book on this, so uh, this is mostly secondhand. Uh, let me say this. So the way you frame this is the direct versus indirect strategy. And this is actually a live debate in the scholarly community. And it relates actually to Mar Martha had to leave, but it relates to that question too. So should we really be targeting corruption or should we be targeting the call it corruptogenic factors in the system that give rise to corruption? And so here, um, mm, and there's a, there's a very distinguished uh, anti-corruption scholar at uh, the University of Gutenberg named Burostein who uh, very much makes the indirect, I mean that's his whole thing, he's like big bang and indirect. So he's actually one of my sort of sparring partners on this because I actually think I disagree on both points. Uh, I talked before about big bang, but here's uh, on direct indirect, my read, and this is admittedly more impressionistic than based on a rigorous evaluation of all the data, is that the indirect stuff is, is hugely important, but so is the direct stuff. So I am not aware of any countries, societies, jurisdictions that made this transition, historical or contemporary, that did not have as a very important component of that strategy attacking corruption as corruption. Right? Prosecuting people and putting people in jail and auditing programs and uh, doing all that sorts of bureaucratic oversight, all those sorts of things, stronger conflict of interest rules. So I am very sympathetic to the argument that those kinds of direct measures are not sufficient, but it, for me it doesn't follow from that that they're not necessary. And this is not to your question, but one thing I noticed that kind of bothers me in the discussions among you know, the community of people is people often make the point that 
what you were calling the direct measures are not sufficient and treat that as if it implies that the direct measures are not necessary. So I re recently engaged in a bit of a debate before all the recent US politics of stuff related to Ukraine blew up. So last year, uh, I engaged in a bit of an exchange with some folks who said the uh, US government, the international community, the IMF, et cetera, were making a mistake by pressing the Ukrainians to improve their prosecutorial and judicial systems such that they could hold high-level politicians criminally accountable. And the argument was, we, should, we shouldn't focus on that. We should focus on the root causes of corruption. Right? We should deal with you know, economic reforms, and we should privatize, and we should do all this stuff. Uh, in addition to not sharing the views of whether those particular prescriptions were a good idea, particularly the privatization part of it, um, that struck me as making a basic conceptual mistake. Right? These are, it's not an either or trade off. And there's a lot of evidence that doing the direct stuff is, I think, really important. But again, part of the reason I want to do more historical digging and learn more about what happened in other countries is to see if whether that intuition is, in fact, true, or whether we do have examples of um, countries that managed to make this transition without a heavy dose of direct anti-corruption. I should also say one more thing about Again, not having read Fukuyama's book, I don't want to target him specifically, but the genre of macro history in which I would think it's fair to say he and others fall is, I appreciate it in many respects, but one of the things that stepping back and having that wide angle lens vision tends to do is to make certain processes seem sort of natural or inevitable by virtue of the operation of underlying fundamental historical forces. Well, when you kind of zoom in, Day to day, it was a constant fight in the trenches, pushing and struggling and so forth. So this period in the US between 1865 and 1941, I'll get to your, your point about that in a moment. But if you step back, it's kind of like, well, and then we had you know, a progressive era and a gilded age and some reforms and so forth, just, and the rising middle class, like it just sort of happened. But if you could zoom in, this was vigorously contested at the time. So without disparaging the utility of this kind of macro history, we need to be careful, I think, we as consumers of it, not to come away with the impression that stuff just sort of happens without people making it happen. Um, so then your point about the US, there's a lot packed in there. Let me see if I can get at some of it. So um, totally right. So civil war, huge amounts of government spending, huge amounts of corruption, a ton of research on that. Uh, so it's a bit arbitrary that we pick that as our starting point. Um, we could have gone back earlier. I have done some reading about the earlier period. and. The strong version of the critical hypothesis of the Civil War was an exceptional period, and like the pre-Civil War period, like things were integrity was basically high. That seems not to be true. And it's just not, not true. The Civil War, as you say, when there are massive government spending programs, if you have a kind of baseline level of corruption, it's going to be all the, all the worse, because there's sort of more to steal, more opportunities to do it. But it's not like uh, the system was basically one of integrity, and we had this anomalous thing that happened that created a bunch of corruption that then kind of faded away. And indeed, we use 1865 as our starting point, but the really systemic corruption, I mean, another generation, it's still happening. Right, uh, you don't really get substantial changes until uh, you start getting things like civil service reform in the 1880s. This is part of the incremental story, but you don't really get more aggressive crackdowns on corruption happening until the early part of the 20th century. Um, the the rats from a sinking ship, or, or not the the inside outside point. Um, I think there's yeah, there has been a bit of research on this, less that point, but there's a paper that was written a while ago. Uh, called something like, or at least the working paper version was called something like uh, strong firms lobby, weak firms bribe, which suggested, it's not the particular point that you're making, but it's kind of has a family resemblance that firms that are very well connected, that have a lot of influence in the policy making process, don't need to pay a lot of bribes because they can actually use their influence to get the rules written in a way that's favorable. Whereas it's firms that are more like on the outside that don't have that degree of political clout that have to pay a lot of bribes because the rules are written in a way that's not terribly favorable to them. I think there's a lot to that, but there's also a lot of evidence that the big powerful firms also engage in what we would think of as like straight up corruption. Um, so even when business is good, one of the reasons business is good for these firms is they can use various forms of corruption to keep out the competition. So it's not the case, for example, that if you're an entrepreneur and it's good times and things are booming and, and we're happy, that you don't have any interest in engaging in corruption, right? After all, as you point out, it's risky. Maybe in a good system, but if the system is one where corruption is deeply entrenched, you feel like, well, I want to protect my monopoly. I want to keep out uh, challengers. I want to make sure. So Vietnam might be a really nice example. But Vietnam has had uh, really rapid growth for the last 20 odd years. And there's some good research about corruption in Vietnam. And you see a fair amount of evidence that firms use corruption and bribery 
to, for example, keep foreign competitors or even other de domestic competitors out of their market. So I think that there's some truth to the point, of course, but I don't think it's generally the case that it's only when you know, times are really bad or you've got a major war that then people feel like now I've got to engage in corruption. In plenty of places where that's, where that's not true. We have one more thing to do. So when you get a chair, the Eli, Eli Goldston Professor of Law, you get a gift. And it's, uh, we've wrapped it carefully so you won't know what it is. Um, and if you would lift the wrapping, you will see what our gift to you right. is from our community. Hope you like it. There you go.